We've got a few people settling in now, but uh, we'll get started in a minute. What a great evening to be inside. <laughs> and really, uh, really want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here this evening and be a part of this event. You know, we, I want to thank the Astra group making this available. It's a great venue for something like this. And, and I, I know just from the conversation out in front, we're enjoying that. Also want to thank all the volunteers the Astros put together for this. A good thank you to Josh Johnson and Lisa Bauer. They're the ones that actually assembled everything. I had an idea to bring these guys down. They agreed to do it. And then all the logistics has to happen. People put it together. Really appreciate all the effort that they, they put in. And thank you to Dr. Michael Hicks and David Terrell for making the trip down to this end of the state. And not often we get, get them to visit here, but, but occasionally we do. And uh, it's always great to, to host you and have you see what we've got going on and give us that. In 2019, uh, Du Bois County Quality of Life and Workforce Attraction Plan identified the county had a relatively low share of young talent but a high retirement risk. We all know that. We see that every day. This means retention and attraction of young talent particularly important for the county's ongoing economy. <coughs> du Bois County Comprehensive Plan was adopted in 2009. However, many of the big ideas that were expressed there are still valid for today. The vision statement for the plan says, Du Bois County strives to be a great place to live, work, and visit by embracing change that fosters economic development opportunity. By embracing change that fosters developing economic opportunity. I wasn't really clear on what those changes might be. Uh, just what we needed to embrace. This evening, I've invited you to, to listen, be part of a conversation with Dr. Michael Hicks and David Terrell on their research, which could provide a different perspective on how we might embrace changes that have already happened around us and consider from a different view how we might boost our local economy so the future is bright. I hope you enjoy this conversation. There'll be time at the end. We're going to have a Q&A session. We'll have a mic. We'll take it around if you have some questions. But at this time, let me introduce our guests. Start with uh, David Terrell. And David is the gentleman over the far end. Uh, raise his hand. He's the founding executive director of the Indiana Communities Mission Institute, or the ICI, and the, the group what? The Rural Policy Research Institute. Yeah, the Rural Policy Research Institute, the Center for Local and State Policy at Ball State University. The ICI was formed with the mission to build greater capacity to achieve prosperity and well-being for their people and places. Mr. Terrell previously served two Indiana lieutenant governors in various positions, including senior advisor and deputy chief of staff, where he oversaw five state agencies. He also was the founding director of the Office of Community and Rural Affairs, a state agency dedicated to rural community economic development. Under Mr. Terrell's leadership, 
Oprah gained national recognition for state level community economic development policy and programming. Further in his career, Mr. Terrell spent nine years in manufacturing leadership, spending most of the time as a plant manager for a steel wire manufacturer in southern Indiana. He also spent several years consulting with communities on economic development and workforce issues. Graduate of Indiana State University, he earned his MBA from the University of South Florida. Mr. Terrell lives in historic Madison, Indiana, on Ohio River where he serves on several nonprofit civic boards. In his free time, Mr. Terrell enjoys hiking and cycling, tries to start every morning with a headstand. <laughs> Welcome, David. <laughs> now, Dr. Hicks is the George and Francis Ball Distinguished Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for Business and Economic Research at Ball State University. He's held faculty positions at the Air Force Institute of Technology, Marshall University, and the University of Tennessee. His research has been reported in such places as The Economist, The Atlantic, Rolling Stone, Vanity Fair, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Washington Post, NPR, CNN, C-SPAN, CNBC, and Fox Business. Michael is a retired infantry soldier in the Army Reserve and peacekeeping and combat service in the Middle East and Africa. Dr. Hicks has been a frequent speaker regarding his research at Accelerate Indiana Municipalities, or AIM, and has presented the state legislature as well, some of the subcommittees. He's a proponent of rural Indiana and its potential. Opposite of David's start in the morning, for Dr. Hicks, he begins with both feet well planted on the ground. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Michael Hicks and David Tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. This is quite a crowd for an event like this. Uh, telling the mayor it must be the alcohol. I don't know. And I also told him um, I think the only two communities in Indiana that might serve alcohol in an event like this would be Madison and Jasper. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of parallels between Madison and Jasper. We were talking about a lot of parallels. So anyway, uh, we love coming to Jasper. We've been here a few times. I've been here several times. I, I was in Bergman, how many years ago, Ken? About 20 years ago, uh, early in the year in uh, Neil, it's good to see you. Congratulations on your new position now. At the time of so it, it's really, and Nancy Eckerly, it's been over 20 years since I've been in this neck of it. So it's, I'm somewhat familiar with you, Morris County, but it's a lot of fun to be here. Um, this is uh, the talk that we're given. Giving. We've given this around the state over probably the last six plus years with updates. And we keep getting asked, we didn't think when we started giving this presentation that it would last that long, <coughs> but uh, <coughs> we keep getting asked to make it. And so we get updates and update the data and so on. It still has a lot of resonance in a lot of communities. So here we go. Uh, I, in, if you weren't forewarned, it's very thick on data. Very, very thick on data. Just letting you know. So get more alcohol, more popcorn, or whatever you want. Um, this is what we're going to talk about today. <coughs> um, this is really what we're between our two uh, practices, we really are working on the convergence of policy and practice. That's really between my shop and my shop. We are, uh, in a lot of ways, we're joined at the hip. You know, we have two, two separate identities. In a lot of ways, we're joined at the hip. And there's a reason for that, and that's because of this divergence of policy, practice, and research. Um, so here we go. Considerations for change. When we think about our communities, and the mayor you, you talked about, we're really thinking about prosperity. How, are, how do we look at prosperity in our community? And there, we've been operating historically in Indiana 
we've been operating under these assumptions for a long time, and a lot of communities still think this way, which is why we keep getting asked to, to come. The assumptions are that um, the key is learning investments in jobs. Investments and jobs are critically and critically important. It's how we get the investments in jobs that we need to think about. But the, 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 uh, the assumption is that manufacturing drives employment and that the growth in the property tax base and local revenue will come with that manufacturing base and job growth causes population growth. Does that all sound familiar? You heard all of these assumptions? They're all wrong. First of all, job creation does not cause population growth. Job creation does not cause population growth. Jobs follow people. Companies will go to where the people are. And Michael talked about this since recently had the data. Um, in a big way across the state, the local revenue mix has changed uh, since the um, implementation of property tax caps. Free property tax cap, I'm talking about the revenue that our local governments have to spend on goods and services from a, and, and on place and those kind of things. Um, and, and Michael talk about this a little bit more, but historically, since free property tax cap, all local revenues were 90% property tax. So that first assumption about factories and those kind of things made a lot of sense. And um, since property tax caps statewide, um, property tax has accounted, revenue has accounted for about 60%, so 60% of the, the local revenue mix. And income tax has risen to be about 30 to 40 percent, depending on the county and the local decisions. So income tax is becoming more and more important in the revenue mix in a lot of communities. And I think you have some New Boys County data tonight. Actually, New Boys County is kind of an outlier in, in some of this, that which we'll talk about, which may present some of the challenges that might be coming in the future. But uh, the local revenue mix has changed and has more reliance on income tax. How does you, how do you increase income tax revenue without raising the tax? There are two ways. Increase your population, increase the, the per capita income. If you increase both of those, you increase your local revenue. Income tax revenue. Um, the other variable here: manufacturing employment is in permanent decline. Manufacturing employment, and applying the word employment, manufacturing employment is in permanent decline. And actually, the way these incentives were created, like tax abatement, different those kinds of things, if you look at the law. These incentives actually encourage this decline. They actually have to accelerate this decline. That's an unintended consequence, but that's what has happened. Um, and then COVID is the big black slime that that has accentuated a lot, a lot of these trends and has created some other trends that we're going to talk about. Um, and but reinforces people choose to live where they live based on the quality of life. That's critically, critically important. People choose where they want to live based on what your community has to offer. And that's the value-added proposition, which we'll talk about, the value proposition that communities have to offer to their, to their residents. So, yeah, from, from this, oops. From this, a lot of communities and a lot of people still think this is a paradigm. But there, there's a new paradigm here, which causes us to have to reframe that discussion. Mike already flipped the 
I'm good. Look for it. Yeah, thank you. So David just offered a pretty provocative argument that much of what people have thought about the way economies work in a town like Jasper or Madison or Muncie is that businesses will be moved there, incentivized to move there, there will, that will offer job openings, people will relocate there. And I'm going to offer you evidence why that's no longer the case and why that's okay and why you all shouldn't be very worried about that. You're doing fairly well at addressing the other things. And this is going to be data intensive. I'm going to sort of stand so I'm not clobbering anybody's view of this. You see that okay? So I'm going to start first talk with what David did about this idea of the capital labor ratio. And so what I have here is the, um, the two line charts. One, the red chart is the jobs per million dollars of investment in today's dollars, inflation adjusted dollars. And so if you go back to this series starts in the late 50s, you can see that uh, if you were to have a million dollars of investment, you get 15 or so jobs coming along with that. Today, you're going to get one, two, or three jobs. The big investment areas, particularly if you look at the large plants at the most recent Fort Wayne plant, billion dollar investment, there are zero new jobs. Investment is increasingly replacing labor, not augmenting it at the firm level in manufacturing. And the other line here just shows the, the what's called the capital labor ratio. If you're a new employee in today's dollars in 1958, you were getting just over $67,000 per worker of capital invested in, in, in you to work in that manufacturing firm. Today, it's, it's well over $325,000. So, so when you hear an elected official, we all do this, and we're all happy to see capital investment in our communities, but those big dollar numbers don't translate into jobs. They do not translate into jobs. And a way to think about this here, Indiana has added over $300 million per year of GDP in manufacturing since 2017 with about five or 4,000 new jobs. That's probably $200 billion worth of capital investment that's gone into Indiana uh, since in manufacturing since 2017. So that big capital investment is not going to translate into jobs. This is what it looks like. So um, this is tomato canning. I have three graphics here. The one in the upper left here is a very low capital to labor ratio. A lot of people, buckets, knives, benches, a pole barn, and, and boys running baskets of tomatoes to and from their mom and aunt. The next 30 years later, we get the first automation. This is a factory in the 1950s. Now women are picking out rotten tomatoes, um, and the rest are moving along with conveyor belt. They're going to be blanched and steamed and canned. The third picture, the bottom right, I got the first two pictures very quickly from archives on the internet. The bottom right picture took me about an hour to find because I needed a person in it. Right? I needed it's capital labor ratio. You have to have a denominator, otherwise your computers don't work. Um, and there's one person there, all the way in the back, with a little red vest on. So we're seeing manufacturing becoming very automated. I'm going to ask you a question now. This that we'll, you'll see the answer to in a little bit. Does anybody know when manufacturing production in India hit its peak in inflation adjusted terms? What year? Inflation adjusted manufacturing peak in Indiana. Any guesses? 2000, that's a good, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? 2007. 2007. Yes, I'm not saying the 2000s. But on Muncie, they all say 1971 or 1944. It, the answer is, 2022. Now, what was peak manufacturing employment in Indiana? What year was that? Nineteen seventy-three. 
And what year was beef manufacturing as a share of the pork in Indiana? Nineteen forty-four. All right. And so I have here are two different uh, time series data on job cumulative job creation in the United States, and the, the United States has been a job creation machine over the past fifty years. This goes back to nineteen seventy. Uh, just a fantastic job creation machine. Um, and there are all types of jobs on categories that categorize into two types. The one are jobs that are attractable or footloose. They could go anywhere. So these are jobs that you produce something for people to consume somewhere else. So all manufacturing, most logistics, all back office financial services, movie production, uh, things like that. Things that you make in one place and sell primarily elsewhere. Most of what you make is sold outside of the region. The other type of jobs aren't really attractable jobs because those are jobs that depend upon local demand. There are local services or goods that are consumed locally. So, so concrete is consumed locally, but really it's mostly services. And so between 1970 and today, the US has been a job creation machine, but it's all been in these jobs, these, these people-based jobs. These are the attractable jobs that we've created in net since 1970. It's negative almost 2 million jobs. So if you're trying to attract business into your community, which is a thing that every community does, it's a perfectly normal activity, these are the jobs that you can attract. If you're trying to build a community where jobs will follow people, that you build people with, these are the types of jobs that you're going after. By the way, these jobs on average pay better than these jobs on average. And so when you think about policies that focus on business attraction, that's great. Everybody does it. There's a, there's a place for that. There's been a lot written about that over the past 50 years. Just be very careful that you're not taking resources away from doing this, from attracting these jobs to chase those jobs. Mike, Mike, essentially what you're dealing with, again, we're not against business attraction. Like Mike said, it has its role. It's literally, a, that's that blue line. It's a national game of whack-a-mole. That, that's what's going on. Wherever there's a new plant opening, New manufacturing plan only, there's one or two shutting down somewhere else. That's what we need to understand. And um, there are plants that I was involved in, gosh, 30 years ago, actually, the plant I was plant manager, it shut down 15 years after I left. I mean, that's the nature in a lot of ways. Du Bois County is an anomaly in a lot of um, but you're also dealing with shutdowns in different ways as well. That's that's the portability nature of, of these kinds of businesses. Absolutely, I love the whack and ball analogy because it really is a challenge in any community that's trying to attract to a job space is that ultimately somebody else is going to lure some of those jobs away, or they're going to be automated, which is what's happened to jobs in manufacturing since 1973. Almost all of that is just due to productivity growth. What took a thousand men and women to produce in the United States in 1970, now just about 250 can produce in inflation adjusted dollars. We're really good at manufacturing. That's why so few of us do it compared to 50 years ago. In areas where we don't see productivity growth in terms of employment, we tend to have more jobs. And the, the most clear example of this is in teaching students in third grade. I got a great picture of my grandfather in about 1898 in third or fourth grade, 25 kids in his class. I get a picture of my dad, 1944, in third grade, um, something like 23 or 24 kids in his class. I went to third grade twice, 1970, 1971. 20, I average of 25 kids in my class, my youngest son, he turns 20 later this month, going to third grade, 
25 kids in his class. Do not see productivity growth in terms of reduced employment. Look at this, it, the schooling may be better, but we're not seeing it costs less. And, and that's really that example. These are where the jobs are, and they're following people, not the other way around. This is just a snapshot of Indiana's manufacturing employment over three decades, uh, well, 35 years now. And you can see uh, here we have, on the right hand side, we have the percent of employment in manufacturing. It's been fairly stable. But in terms of numbers, it has not been. It's on a trajectory here. We've not recovered our pre-COVID manufacturing employment. So the governor quoted really great new capital investment numbers last night in his state of the state address about manufacturing, we have fewer factory jobs than we had in 2018. And, th and that's not a bad thing, we're very good at it, but it means that you shouldn't expect employment growth in a region that will accompany manufacturing production. And this just shows the picture of the job losses so far in the 21st century in manufacturing and so the size of the bubble or how many jobs were, were lost, um, this shows the employment change. And then this is the monthly wages. So we're losing the higher wage jobs and gaining primarily lower wage jobs in manufacturing with a few exceptions. This is coal mining. We're down to about 2,000 coal miners in Indiana and chemical manufacturing. So we're not trading out great manufacturing jobs for the ones that we had before. And what that means is, with few exceptions, this is not going to be a path to regional prosperity. Manufacturing is still a great, uh, important industry. Uh, I invest in it through my retirement funds. Anybody who knows anything about manufacturing should be excited about it. But it also holds risk for a region that's overly dependent on manufacturing. It doesn't do other things make people want to live in that community. This is probably the biggest wake-up call graphic other than the one from two before. This is cumulative employment growth in the United States from 1992 to 2002, or 2022, excuse me. And there are four different data series we have. So this is cumulative job growth in the United States. And there are people with bachelor's degrees or higher, that's the black line, 25 or 17 million jobs. There are people with a uh, associate degree or some college, that's the gray line. There's the blue line or high school graduates and the red line or less than high school graduates. So over the past 32, 33 years now, we have good data. The United States, 81% of jobs that we have created, the net employment growth have gone to college graduates. The other 19% or so have gone to either an associate degree in a very small number, right, in, in thousands, 384,000 um, in, in high school, or I'm sorry, that's in, in high school graduates. 384,000. So just to keep that in context, the United States graduates about a million kids a year, about 500,000 of them are high school graduates, and that's all they'll be. And so the jobs that are available for people who've not been to college are replacement jobs. There's not gonna be job growth. And that's okay, we need plumbers, we need trades. The, the net number are not expanding. So if you, the point here is not that these are bad jobs. The point is if you want to grow a region, you're going to have to do it with people who have been to college. That's where the population growth will come. Those are the, both the mobile population and the, where the job growth is coming. And by the way, if you look at this data from 2009, the end of the Great Recession in June of 2009 through the most recent, which is the middle of last year, it hit 100% of the job growth of college graduates nationwide. In Indiana, the numbers are nowhere near as good. So these are high school graduates. There are fewer jobs today for high school graduates than there were in 1998. The data at 
the same model doesn't go back to 1992. The biggest job growth we've had come with people with, a, th these are bachelor's degrees, these are an associate degree, and these are less than high school. So we've seen, and this, by the way, is most almost exclusively manufacturing. So making it is deployment of people and the demand for labor um, is not like the national average. And even so, so to put this in context, 130,000 of those jobs created are going to be roughly 39% um, of kids that are in a four-year degree or higher in Indiana. So, you know, more than half the job. So it's a, the labor market is definitely swinging towards higher levels of educational attainment. I'm going to swap, I'm going to move from labor markets to, to some of the tax data that we talked about. So David mentioned that since property tax caps, which happened over a two-year cycle from 2008 to 2010, the income tax has become a disproportionate share of tax base for most counties. It's about 38, 39%, I think, last I saw. Um, Counties, tip, I would say 85 counties range between 30 and 40% of their income through income tax or their tax revenues, the remainder through property tax. The Boise County is about 20% income tax, the rest are, are property tax. The state has not released all the 2020, 2021 data. This is simply your county. And there's three different elements here. This is the effective property tax. I will spell them up. The effective property tax rate in your county and come across all property types is 1.24, up from a low of 1.18, down from about 1.35 in 2007. And your overall effective income tax rate, that's income. That's the taxes, total income tax divided by total personal income is now lower than it was 20 years ago. Your tax rate in this county, the effective tax rate is lower than it was 20 years ago. And the, the other piece here is tax increment financing. That's the amount of, of property that's in TIF. Very small percentage. Most counties are higher than this. And it's been used reasonably well in my judgment, just afford to see what that is. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm bouncing around through several studies. I'm going to talk about a couple more labor market issues and then um, going to go into our quality of life discussion. So a colleague of mine at the University of Akron, Amanda Weinstein, did a really interesting study. She looked at um, job skills because every occupation in the United States, over a thousand of them, has a listing of skills that attend to them. And they're, they're put into different buckets. There's cognitive bucket. These are thinking jobs primarily. Every job has parts of all of these. Um, but there's thinking job, and then there's jobs that are primarily skills-based, hands-based. And then there's jobs that are people-based, leadership jobs, customer service, and the like. So cognitive skills, people skills, and motor skills. And these, then you could look at a region or at a metropolitan area and see what type of, we know what type of occupations are at a metropolitan area, and we can see what type of uh, skills dominate each metro area in the United States. And so what she did was uh, match the, all of these counties, all these metropolitan areas, and we don't have good data in rural areas, which is, I'll show you some data on that in a minute. And she looked at the unemployment rate in the places that are high cognitive and high people skills dominated by those, and those that are dominated by motor skills. This would be primarily manufacturing with some logistics. And the cyclical rate here, the unemployment rate is much higher in those places. So volatility is much higher in labor markets in those places. You've been more stable here, in terms of employment and manufacturing, but uh, that is not something that will necessarily persist. And volatility catches up to us at all at some point. Um, 
the this graphic here uh, begins our discussion on quality of life. Um, what's I think interesting about it is the United States started in 1972 to ask people surveys about why they moved. And in the early 1970s, the first was in 1972, the questions were about, did you leave because you, you got married, did you leave for a job, did you leave because you were transferred from another job? Uh, they were a very small number of employment-focused questions. It wasn't until the 1980s they started asking questions like, are you, why are you in your new home? Why did you choose this community? And is it because of crime, proximity of family, things like that? And we saw as early as the 1980s that this job question was pretty small. Why did you choose this community? Proximity to job was in the 12, 14% range. And the quality of schools and public services was even lower. So back in the 1980s, it was pretty small. That question on schools and public services steadily got bigger and then it exploded. This survey is, is given every two years. I have five year snapshots of the full questionnaire. And now it's a very high proportion of why people are new jobs. We don't know exactly why there was an explosion here, but there's two hypotheses. One is that between 2001 and 2007, the No Child Left Behind Act passed. So we had fairly objective measures of every school and some quality measure of every school in the United States. Prior to 2001, we didn't really have an objective measure. And I know that because I moved to places looking at school quality with my oldest at that time, where it's very difficult, even for a researcher, to get a good objective measure of school quality. All schools were good in 2001. By 2007, it was obvious that that was not the case to anybody who was considering relocating. I lived in West Virginia, by the way, it was illegal for a realtor to talk about school quality in West Virginia. The teachers union that made sure that they couldn't do that. Today it's very hot. The other possibility is just the internet makes it very easy now. There's both public and private sector data on schools and other public services. But we're also a richer society, so we care more about the quality of public services. Okay. So um, we should you the data that, that really kind of reinforce the notion of, of population, population growth, and how population is important and maybe more important than a lot of variables we've been thinking about. And the big variable is quality of life. And so Mike's going to show you some other data, but we're going to show you some qualitative data. Basically, hearing what people are saying, what's important. So uh, university, I'm going to talk about a couple of studies real quickly. University of Wisconsin did this major study across the state, and they, they asked a fundamental question. What are the perceived, what are the five most important qualities of people? Top one is schools. The, the next one is uh, affordability and diversity of housing, uh, outdoor amenities such as park trails, etc. And two critically important things, because this gets into a bunch of, quote, soft stuff. A small town sense of community and civic engagement. People actually do want to get involved. They want to feel like they're welcome to be involved. People really do want that. The next study shows that, too. And then the other one is proximity to cities to offer employment, that offer employment, entertainment, and shopping. That means a community doesn't have to be all things to all people. It's okay to leave for a day to go do something and come back. It's okay. That introduces the regional centers concept, which is critically critical and important to understand. And then uh, the, the Knight Foundation did this huge study over three years, again, asking uh, about place attachment and what keeps people in their communities. And uh, they found that, very similar to the Wisconsin study, but this is a national study, that social offerings, things for people to do, are critically important. These are the top four. Openness, and it goes back to the engagement component. Transparency, uh, people can easily engage. 
and, and it's across the board. And aesthetics, what does our community look like? Community aesthetics, uh, back in my other life, I would talk about going down Main Street. It speaks a lot to what the community is like. I call it the carrot canary in the coal mine. It, it's, it's that in that. People will drive your, through your community, not talk to a certain person, and they might, if it's not looking good, they're going to drive right through. That's, it's surprising how many people do that, or they may stop and talk to people, depending on how the community looks. It's those kinds of things. And then school quality is in there. Education is critically important. Um, again, these are all characteristics of value. What is the value that is offered to our residents? And we're going to keep coming back to that value proposition over and over again. But economists don't like to ask people their opinions. And part of it's because we just have a really bad social skill. And so what we prefer to do is to watch what people do. We like to observe behavior. And we observe behaviors in markets. And so for about 40 years, in different places, economists have been trying to measure quality of life. And this is how we do it. We say we 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 would like to have a, an identical home in every U.S. county or every U.S. city, and then how much more people were willing to pay for that identical that identical home in the, in the county is a reflection of the amenities that that community has. Some of them are natural amenities like weather and and climate and or amount of mountains. Maybe they're public amenities like the quality of schools or the safety of the community, or they're uh, private amenities that follow people, things like shopping and entertainment, facilities like this. We don't have an identical home in every U.S. county, but, but we have enough data that we can create a statistically identical home in every U.S. county by controlling for the number of rooms, the year the home was built, and other characteristics. And so whatever unexplained premium that people are willing to place on that home marks a place as higher quality of life. And if the place is valued less, if people are willing to pay less for that statistically identical home, that's a bad place. A place that has less, it's less desirable. And instead of asking people, in that case, we're looking at the market behavior of all Americans, not just the people who chose to live there, but the people who chose not to live there. And that gives you one measure of quality of life. And we have the same thing for, how, for, for labor markets as well, because jobs are important to people as well. And so we know if we had a statistically identical worker, a worker could go anywhere, the worker would be willing to take just a little bit lower wage to live in a nice place. That's evidence that that's a nice place. So I'm willing to give up or economists say we're, we're willing to, to accept a lower wage. But if I have to take a little bit higher wage to live there, then I'm saying I'm willing to accept not a pay cut, but a pay premium to live there. And so what economists do is we take the difference between the housing and that labor market to get a single point estimate of quality of life for every county. And it makes sense, right? Because in the first measure of this, every realtor knows that Location, location, location determines home value. Not the home characteristics itself, but where it is. We know things like school quality explains 30% of home variations. So quality of life can be measured in housing value, but we also knew, know that it's measured in labor markets. When I first moved to Muncie, I moved in, my next door neighbor were a pair of physicians, and I, I walked over to chat a little bit. And the husband was responsible for hiring at the local hospital. And I said, well, how are things going? He said, oh, it's horrible here. Do you know I have to pay people more to work in Muncie than I do in Carmel? That's the example. So, so and, and then when we released our study, this is a study that was released to Brookings Institution as well. When we released that study, um, a colleague of mine, uh, our, Richard Florida, who's an economist in Toronto, said, oh, that's great, I just bought a home in Traverse City, Michigan, which was our, one of our top places. And I got an email from a buddy in, in Michigan who saw this study and he said, now I finally get what you've been talking about. 
They said, because in, in Traverse City, we have a uh, saying that's half the pay for a view of the bay. Right, so this is a rough and ready measure of quality of life. And so the question, we've done this, and I'll show you a map here in a minute, but we want to know whether or not population change is affected by quality of life. And so these are micropolitan, I'll move out of the way, micropolitan areas here. We were able to do down to the county level in this study in 2019. And so there's a correlation here between population growth after 2010 and quality of life that's positive. Yeah, yeah for point of reference, two voice counties is not for quality. Yes. With above average quality of life. And in the last three years, above average population growth. We'll get more to that in a minute. Um, but the, this, in the same way that, fam that families prefer this quality of life measure, you can use the same measure to look at business environment because businesses would be willing to pay more for both productive land and productive people. But that's not producing population growth. So this is important. We said population growth is important. Everybody gets that, I think. It's important to go back to employment growth, though, as well. Um, this is that same graphic in employment. And this, it seems like a small value, right? It is about twice as effective quality of life is about twice as effective in attracting jobs as it is people. And why is that? Because the people who are going to move for quality of life are mostly young people who are heavily employed. Still no, no statistical effect on job growth and quality of business environment. And that goes back to jobs total people. Correct. This is one of the major strains of academic research over the past 30 years who concluded the jobs are following people. People are following jobs. And we know individually people do. But I chose Muncie because there was a job I wanted to go there, but I live in Yorktown because of the community. But people are still choosing locally where they live, even if they move to your metro area for a job. And we've said some provocative things here, so I'm going to start saying some more. Don't, don't. Don't tell people you have low cost of living in your community. Because what you're saying is people don't value your, your community very highly. Say we have high value here. Maybe we have a very responsive housing stock. But you can see people are moving to high priced areas. This is population growth. This is median home value. People are moving to high cost places. They're not, and this persists past COVID, right? This is 2010 to 2019. It's even more acute now. People are mostly moving to higher cost areas. Now that's not true if people are moving out of city center areas. And we'll talk more about remote work in a moment, but it's, people are still choosing more expensive places. These are Indiana counties. Likewise, as we said over and over, and David keeps saying, the value proposition what matters. These are all the counties in the Midwest, the Great Lakes states of Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. This is the effective state and local tax rate in those counties, and this is population change. People are, and that's zero. So these places, these low tax places are losing people. It's the high tax places that are gaining. And that's not because people like taxes. I'm an economist. My hair turns white when I think about taxes. It's because they like the value of the public services those taxes deliver. And the value of those taxes are then capitalized into home values. So higher tax rates generally deliver better schools, better public services like safer communities, better amenities that then result in higher home values. As so, I'm so here's another way of looking at, at uh, what we've been talking about a little more. <clears throat> By the way, or man, you've seen most of these, uh, 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 the, the things we offer. And we did a little session about how to look at some of this differently. So um, we took them through this exercise. We're not gonna, this can be a two hour work. Everything we're talking about squeezing in can be a series of two hour workshops. So, one of the things we ask is when people come to your community, even when they move to their community, 
what do they think about? It? By the way, this is Madison County what it is. Um, my house is right over there, about a block away from the theater. That's a lot of this theater. And actually, Mike's family has a cabin right around that corner. <laughs> so if you want to go and check us out, come and say hi. Uh, but what do you think of? Do you think of taxes? You drive through a community and love the community and say, I love their tax rates. No one knows. Or if they do, they're weird. They're the mic. <laughs> <laughs> they think of what the community has to offer. They think of the value. So there's another way of looking at this, and this is a lot of research that started at Iowa State and through the Rural Policy Research Institute, through Rupery. Uh, Emily Warnell, our sociologist, has really doubled down on that, which is informing the research that Mike and his colleagues are doing on quality of life. And by the way, Mike, is right, Mike and his colleagues are writing a book on quality of life, all the economic impacts of quality of life. Um, and so the, the research from goes flora and flora out of Iowa State. So Google them to see the beginnings of this. But this is what Rupert came up with. So, uh, when we think, often when we think of community prosperity, and depending on what we're in, and even making decisions, we often think of only the financial wealth of the community, you know, the taxes and things like that. But communities have all kinds of different capitals, all kinds of different levels. Actually, we have a handout that has a list of these things that you can, you can um, get, I don't know where the handout is, you'll have them in the back. But uh, there's financial, intellectual, human, social, cultural, political, physical, natural. The community has wealth in each of these categories, all kinds of wealth. That's the first thing, that's the framework. And you can actually do asset mapping along this. In the workshops we do, we, have, we talk people through asset mapping in the community, and actually that's what the handout shows. But there are other components to it as well. You can when you make a decision, and we're, this is tax abatement, but the other kind of decision fronts, and uh, you know, Ed's here, and you're, I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with return on investment for incentives. Often, uh, it's focused mostly on financial, the ROI on taxes and so on, and, but there are other impacts that attraction project or expansion project may have on the community that can be yay or nay in, in, in throughout, throughout the process. And, if you, and you can, what we are encouraging that people, communities to do is go through and understand there's two components. A decision can have a long term, first of all, these capitals interact. You need to understand that. What may impact the financial capital could have a negative impact. We're going to have a positive impact. So there's the positive impact, negative impact, long-term impact, short-term impact. I mean, if it's multi-dimensional on what the impacts can be. We had the mayors go through this, and it's pretty mind-boggling. But it's pretty eye-opening, too, on some of these decisions that can go through. So it's not just as simple as an ROI. Um, you could have, a, in fact, Muncie. At a, an attraction project for um, a chemical recycler that was very notorious. And they were, and actually, the chemical recycler was going to be upwind of the hospital and the university. So all the prevailing winds were going to go. And it, and it did have a history of, of uh, perjury in, in particular. That. So it, that they only looked at the financial ROI. It did not look at these other variables um, right here. But, um, but I think the professors, the, the environment professors and so on at Ball State, they said, wait a minute. And so it's now in another community in Northern New York. They didn't do it either. But the, these are the things we need to think about, short-term, long-term, positive, negative. But there's another way, and actually Mike wrote a column uh, about almost exactly a year ago 
about, about these things, and it, it's how we manage debt and, and, and you know, our public debt, and essentially in the public sphere, debt, public debt's actually an investment, investment contribution, that's the value proposition. So you can be incredibly healthy. In fact, I had in my community, several mayors ago, they were incredibly proud of how little debt they had. Incredibly proud. Our current mayor has had to float a bond of $12 million because of the deferred investment in the water system. So what we had is we were incredibly healthy here in that context with the low debt, but we had huge deficits in our physical infrastructure natural infrastructure. And so that's a long-term consequence. It's a balancing act. It's a balancing act. You know, in my other life, I think we only have dealt with this. When we gave grants uh, to communities, one of the first things we asked, especially for sewer and water infrastructure, how long has it been since you've raised your rates? That's, that's the deficit discussion. COVID exposed our lack of investment in our public service. We have a huge public service debt in terms of our public health departments and so, so on. So it being, quote, financially healthy in terms of low debt may not be necessarily a sign of a healthy community. That's what we need to understand. That's the other dimension of the value proposition. We're all Republicans. We're all conservatives, but we need to understand the issue of value. We need to understand the issue of value. That's a conservative principle. So moving on, um, and going back to Mike's work, we can map these predictors of quality of life through the capitals. And this is where Mike's research is going in the interpretation of So shifting onto that, and this is the last issue we're talking about, remote work. Remote work. So uh, this is national, no, in Indiana, pretty much like national. But this is the percentage of remote workers in the workforce from 1980 to 2018. And actually, I'm going to tell on Mike because I think around 2014 or 2015, I was telling Mike, you know, this is something I'm noticing. We need to start measuring, trying to figure out remote work. But at the time, no one was measuring remote work. No one was measuring it. And I actually found some databases from, uh, uh, like employment services, manpower and things like that, and they were measuring. And so we were depending on what they had. But they, they finally started measuring it. So this is right before COVID, 5.6% 5, 5, 5 of workforce. And so this is it in Indiana. And boom, that's the black swan event. You know what a black swan event is? It's some major event that act absolutely changes everything. 9 11 was a black swan event. This is a black swan event. COVID was a black swan event in a lot of fronts. But in terms of the workplace, this is a black swan event. And so you can see the 48 for now, and this is, we can talk about it a little bit more, but close to 50% of Folks with a BA or more, bachelor's degree or more, will work from home at least one day a week. And the uh, I'm going to go to the next chart. You can see the 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 some college is uh, around twenty some percent. But this is it in the chart. You can see the education level, um, forty percent uh, bachelor's degree. Some college twenty four percent. Even less than high school, close to 10% of less than high school work from home at least one day a week. But look at the income. $200,000 above, and oh, way over 50%, close to 70% of the high income, high, high income folks work from home at least part of the time. And the mayor, you were pointing out houses of people who actually do this uh, throughout the town. So uh, this is happening in every community. This is a huge, huge game changer 
for the good for communities that pay attention to quality of life. This is huge. Um, and we did the math, and, and um, we, we took this data essentially, and then took the other you know, workforce data and so on for the state and for Dubois County. And this is something to, to really think about in terms of the future of Dubois County. This is remote workers. So these are the, the, the top categories by numbers across the state of Indiana. And you can see how remote workers far outnumber the next, the next largest number, which is manufacturing, and then healthcare and retail. Um, this is different in Dubois County. Most counties reflect or are parallel to uh, Indiana. We've done this for about 30 counties. There are two counties that are like this. The Dubois and Elkhart County. Elkhart County is the same way. Manufacturing far out numbers. The next category. The next category is remote work. And we worked closely with those mayors up there, with then Mayor Sessin and Mayor Robertson. Um, they were very, very worried about being heavily dependent on manufacturing. Not just RV manufacturing, but heavily dependent on manufacturing, period. And they were really trying to work on things to diversify their economies. And they're making great strides on it, you know, some really good stuff. But um, if you're heavy on manufacturing and plant, that's not a bad thing. I mean, you understand it's not a bad thing. It's kind of it's it's counter to a lot of trends right now. I think it's something to pay attention to, according to the data that we've been sharing with you that, that we need to understand. Um, I'm gonna ask Mike to talk about this really quickly. We did a study for uh, Lieutenant Governor on rural. Right, and so what we did for Lieutenant Governor in this large rural study of about hundred some a very dense study is we we were asked where are the places in rural Indiana, about sixty some counties in the over definition, that were most likely to have opportunities in remote work. So we looked at the places that had high housing value, quality of life measures. We ignored the labor market ones because those won't matter as much. They still will matter because a lot of remote workers may have family members who are still looking for a local job as well. And then we said, you know, they have to have a high housing value, and do you have schools that are A or should be a, a, the, the older A ranking system was only 8% of schools, so it, 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 they had uh, not very much great inflation there, so strong B plus or A schools, and we listed these counties. So these are counties that we think, and they're, and they're just, they're, they're just ranked by um, the housing rank, I think. No, maybe just alphabetically. But this is the this is one of the counties that we think in Indiana are high opportunity areas for quality of life. And if we look at what's happened to your population over the past couple of years, that suggests we were pretty right on that before. And that's it's not just true for for Du Bois County, there are other counties, I think it's really important to understand Indiana has about 40 counties, 45 counties that are above the national average in quality of life. There, so, so we don't, it's, the, the idea that Indiana is a bad quality of life, we don't have things that people don't like, just is not true. Um, people are very heterogeneous in their preferences. Um, and if we look at, at places that are likely to do well, they look a lot like this. You have a very low crime rate, very good school. You have schools that you can actually advertise and market. Not every place does. They don't, everybody says they have good schools. You actually do. And so those are both on the survey research, research from the University of Wisconsin that David talked about. In our empirical work, that's the number one attractor. That's the number one decision maker for schools because the people who move are in that age range, either they have families or they're about to start families, and that's really a big determinant. There are other factors that are outside your control. The climate here, the weather is pretty nice. Um, you may not think so, but visit Elkhart. 
Um, the, the, uh, you know, there are many attributes on that quality list that I think are important, but that's a real, the previous graph that shows 6,900 remote workers, my hunch is in 2030 there'll be more remote workers here than factory workers, even if factory employment remains steady. So, and that's going to come from an increase in the number of remote workers in the incumbent workforce. We're going to get better at it. And I'll just leave by closing as I taught a freshman class this last fall for the first time in a number of years. And the first thing I asked my students early on, I said, how many of you have recently changed majors or have chosen your major because you're thinking about having a remote work job so you could live anywhere you want? More than half the students raised their hand. So at Ball State, of 61 kids in my class, more than half either selected a major or had changed a major to something that would accommodate remote work. So that gives you a sense of where that's going. So just real quickly, these are all things that we've talked about. Um, quality of life. Um, is much more than footloose and really it really affects pretty much all jobs. Um, local government plays a narrow but critical role and it's because of the demand of the services that our residents want. Local government plays that role in a lot of ways. So we cannot we cannot discount that. We cannot discount the role of local it's incredibly important. Um, and don't shortchange short quality of life or other economic development goals. Um, and we can talk about that a little more if you want. And again, households are willing to move to higher cost places as long as the value is there. As long as the value is there. You know, people around the state resent talking about Hamilton County. This is the hot, fastest growing county in Indiana and much of the Midwest. They don't have low taxes. They really don't have low taxes. It's because of the value that's offered to their residents. It's value, value, value. And I think that's it. So hopefully I have time for questions. Thank you. You know, Mike, we're running it up right now. Let's get it done. Well, I know I know it's been thought of what is. You know, what where we come from, what we've experienced, what our mindset's been. They try us some new thinking. Uh, I'd be able to answer any questions you might have at this time. We've got a mic out there, so if anyone raise your hand, I can address the gentleman. I know from my standpoint, balance uh, is balancing the quality of life investment with those things that I consider them have to be infrastructure, they're, they're necessities of life. The things that residents require on a daily basis. Well, I think we need to remember that those necessities are components of quality of life. Uh, I mean, too many times we think about quality of life as what the square looks like and, and those kinds of things. But, you know, it, it, you know, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I mean, you can have a great square, but you don't have great sewer and water. <laughs> uh, forget about it. And so that is part of quality of life. So don't discount. It's quality of life for large, I would say. But <clears throat> the amenities and the parks and what the square looks like are incredibly important to them. So it, it is balanced. There's one back here. Hey, thank you guys so much. Um, really insightful. I work for a manufacturer. I'm a remote worker. I have teams spread across the entire United States. I'm trying to figure out what to do to get more people to work out of our office, right? So it really hits home. So what I'm curious about is, can you tell me about what you see? So you talked about infrastructure, 
But what other examples in the state have you seen that have had a high impact on quality of life? Are there any big wins that come to mind? I think um, there's not a silver bullet. Um, I, I think it, it's uh, communities that have worked on a lot of small wins in an incremental way. Briefly, I think uh, what you know the mayor showed us around a little bit. I think the things, frankly, you're doing a lot of things uh, that uh, are headed in the right direction. I mean, I. I and I kept telling him he needs to go see Mayor Courtney over in Madison. And I, I work closely with Mayor Courtney on my personal level. And they're doing a lot of things that uh, are cumulatively are building up into big winners. And a lot of parallels there. And um, I just drew a blank on what I was going to say. I was going to say, so we didn't show in this graphic because we were getting along, but we actually have a ranking for what people prefer. We put everything, all that we had, once we predict, once we got the quality of life measure, we had 500 quality of life or different amenities. Everything from the Herpendall Index of religious participation to the mean elevation change within a county. And so we just ran an AI algorithm to see which one of those best predicted quality of life. Uh, and we put it in three buckets, natural amenities, public amenities, government provided things, and then uh, endogenous or private amenities, things that some kind of be there if you've got out of, government got out of the way. And so just to take it in order, people really like the same things. They like mountains, they like water, uh, they like warmer Januarys and cooler Julys, but they don't like them a lot. They were, they were all valuable, but they were very modest predictors of the quality of life measure, in part because everybody who likes Minnesota likes cold weather, which is part of, we've already sorted in that way. In, in the other one, people pretty much prefer the same things. They like fitness centers and, and, and you know, recreation facilities and arts facilities, things like that. And there's a lot of value for variety. It's tough for a place like this. You know, Chicago has a lot of variety. Um, you know, Jasper's going to have less variety because you have you know, three, four fewer zeros in your population, three fewer zeros than they do. Um, and, but the area that you can work on in policy is those public amenities. And number one, the one piece that was bigger than everything else was was they were measures of school quality. Number two was crime. Number three was the share of working remotely. And we got down to that, and the reason that's kind of important, as you know, as a remote worker, I learned studying remote work and reading a lot over the past few years, is that you have to have some infrastructure around you, things like broadband, or be able to go to a print shop, mm -hmm. or having that third place that you could meet a client at for a cup of coffee that wasn't your, you know, uh, used to be your dog's bedroom before COVID, things like that. So, so. There was really strong emphasis on the you know, data that I, you know, I'm a free market economist, been one for a long time. Government has a very narrow critical role in those things, of, those public services, not just the infrastructure, the infrastructure is important, things like this, but what are you wrapping around that? What are you providing within this? Once you've invested in this facility, what are you, else are you doing with it? There are a lot of communities that have re renovated theaters. There's really damn few of them that have a bar in it and a private place that you can take and all the other stuff that you yeah. have. So, so that part of it's important. And, and the other thing I'll just end with that Indiana does really well is we get out of the way of business. You, you, know, you don't need to incentivize somebody to come to your community to sell goods and services and make a profit. You just got to get out of the way. Or you got to let them start that business. You got to let them drive and do things, and I think that's, we, we do that really well here, and it's exemplified here with the density of business that we have. And when you look at those markers, you know, you mentioned school quality and crime. I'm going to, let's unpack crime. What does that mean? You know, obviously it might mean a huge investment in police force, which it means, but it might also mean really good park system, really good uh, social programs, really good drug intervention programs. There's a lot of variables that go into that. So uh, we need to understand in our community, 
Why are the variables that impact these big measures? And I think the other thing that, that we need to change our paradigm about, you know, which is where I drew the blank, um, this is a long game. We need, we, need to under, we need to switch our time frames. In the, old, in the old days, when we thought, frankly, and, and I dealt in this world, and uh, people still deal in this world, we honestly thought that if we attracted the factory, the major employer, that will solve all of our problems. That's the short game. That's the short game. The short game doesn't work. When we talk about the things that we've been talking about, that requires long-term engagement, that requires understanding the balance, the need for investments, that may take time. That requires a lot of conversations, a lot of public conversations about tax rates and things like that. So we need to be patient with ourselves and patient as a community, but we need to understand what we are, we have to keep our eye on the prize, but we also need to understand that a long game, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Who else has a question? We don't all need to keep going, right? One of the things I've noticed uh, in, particularly in Jasper, but I think I know it's all over the state, um, in quality of life, I noticed that you didn't really address a whole lot about housing. And there's a serious problem with housing availability in communities the size of Jasper and smaller. Um, I know there's a lot of companies that that have businesses in Indiana where they're addressing it, like um, the town of Spencer, I can't think of the name of that manufacturer there. Um, they're building houses for people to live in in their community. Um, where I'm originally from, where Red Bull is, they build houses for people to live um, in the town where they're located. Um, what impact does this housing, um, it's, it's difficult to find a house to buy. What impact does that have on the quality of life? Yeah, great question. So um, in, in places that are growing, in, actually growing in Indiana, let me just back up and say, according to the census, there are close to 300,000 excess homes in Indiana. Is your homes that you could live in right now, they're just in places that people don't want to live. And so that overhang of homes casts a shadow on housing markets across much of the state. And so, I mean, it, it has an effect countywide. Uh, in, in this county, you're building homes, it's profitable to build homes in this county. There are about 40 Indiana counties where it's not profitable to build a home because there's an excess supply of homes that nobody wants to live in. Banks use banks don't use the MLS data, right? They use they use a little bit, but they're looking at the census data. They have a better sense of what that is. And so it's very difficult to get a loan in a place that has an excess supply of, of housing. And and for a builder, the cost of building that home is often in, in Delaware County where I live, um, my home was built um, in 1992 for and sold at about the same nominal price that I could sell it for now. So you couldn't build my home for anything like that today. And so housing markets are very, very local. I wouldn't worry about statewide housing markets where people are moving to, we're getting housing being built. We're seeing pretty good, we've outbuilt homes here in Indiana over the past 30 years uh, but they're going to those few counties where population is growing. What you've, what you've had here is very modest growth for a while, and then pretty sharp growth over the past two or three years post-COVID. And so it sh should be profitable to build a market rate home here. So it's a very, you know, that that's going to be part of the calculus for expansion. I wouldn't rule out government support for that. I would rule out government support in building housing in a place where it's in decline. The excess supply is not gonna fix your demand problem. If you're growing, how you meet that excess, that, that excess demand is, a, is, a, is an issue. And so this, this type of place has the happiest of real estate problems in the sense that 
Yeah, it's really hard to buy a home right now, I suspect, because people want to live. Now, that's a good problem to have. It's a particularly good problem to have if you're a builder. Yeah, and, uh, and the communities where we talk with, where they will say that, one of our, and they, and we know that it costs more to build a home than they can sell it. Our first question to them is, how many abandoned homes do you have? Or not in good condition homes? And the mayors that we know have been successful in dealing with that, the first thing they did before they even came to building homes was they had an aggressive uh, demolition campaign. They aggressively took over the homes and, and uh, demolished them. Um, I think the shining example, you know, I say, Mayor Land Solid. Uh, incredibly successful with that. Um, I think he told me in a, like two or three year period, he tore down in a very public way. Tore down, I mean, you can probably find it on Facebook. He tore down over 100 homes in a two or three year period. Then he started on infill. We met with Mayor Robertson about three years ago. We told him his problem, and it was the same thing. He started an aggressive rehab and tear down program. Uh, another great example, um, and, and brought Mayor Buttigieg of National Notoriety, a thousand homes in a thousand days. They, all these mayors right-sized the market before they started working on building homes. So that would be the first question I asked, but I don't think Du Bois County has, has that problem. Certainly not Jasper. Mayor gave us a tour today. We went through what he said was the crummiest part of town. <laughs> My words, not his. Um, and there wasn't a single home that needed to be uh, eliminated. And we, and we said, uh, you know, I have a mayor, just many mayors would love this to be the crumbs. Right, that's, a, that's not a problem that, that you have. You, you may think you have it, but relative to other places in the Midwest, it's trivial. Dr. Davis, you touched on a concept that I'd like to hear a little bit more about, and that's the third stage, right? People will have a job or they go home and they're not going to be Right, it's a new term from sociologists, and normally I struggle understanding them, but this one really made a lot of sense. Um, you, you know, um, particularly when you have children, you have a third place. It's the high school, it's the elementary school, it's the sports field. Um, third places, oftentimes in, in extremely rural places, it's very difficult to find a third place. You got a home, you got to work, and another place that you can meet. In, in uh, very urban places you have them, suburban places you tend not to have it's, it's just it's a place that you can gather for work or leisure that you can be at for a period of time um, and that's a, a for um, a variety of reasons i don't want to go into a long lecture on this those have been indicted for hundreds of years as being very responsible for productivity growth and workforce human capital better job matching People meet in a place, um, they learn things, they get better at their work, they get more satisfaction in their community, and they're, they're better able to match to the job or the employer that they want. And so third places are something that communities, bigger suburban places like Noblesville or Fisher would have struggled with that. You all have a lot of what I, from what I can see from a couple of times I've been here and then today's longest driving to remember these third places, but there are things like the like the downtown. This is as cute a downtown as you can find in Indiana. I mean, you've been to all of them, I've been to 60% um, of them. But that's the type of place that we're talking about that you can meet and interact with people. And it, it, in some places it requires public investment, directly helping craft that third place. Other places it simply means to get out of the way and let the permitting process work quickly to build a third place that's commercial and viable and, and sustainable through the private sector. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> the coffee shops are a third place. Actually, in a lot of really rural communities, that's still enough big enough to have them. McDonald's is a third place, uh, and they all have internet. Um, 
the, the, the thing about the, the third place, the special coverage places, uh, they also have things for people to do. Uh, and, you know, you can interact, or there might be some art there, some other things going. Uh, a colleague of ours, Brian Black, who gives all kinds of workshops on this kind of thing. The, uh, the corners on the square could be a third place, especially the fireplace. Uh, that's real cool. Um, so, uh, and again, you, you have a lot of those places. There might be opportunities for more. But this is an example of where uh, maybe if government stays out of the way but encourages something, the private sector can step in as well. It, you know, it doesn't have to be a public investment. But it depends on, on, depends on the situation. I wouldn't shy away from it in certain circumstances. Like this one. That that answer your question. Hi. Um, so first of all, I just want to say that I spent the more vulnerable years of my life. That were just up the street from you guys in Madison at Hanover and uh, enjoyed very much. Yeah, we, we still claim Hanover. <laughs> Hanover, the town of Hanover doesn't claim Madison. Mm -hmm. you know, we'll Hanover town. Um, so, my question to you is is when you're looking at quality of life in the community um, and you look at if you look at where we stand, I, I found one of your slides very interesting. It, it rated um, it rated us at number 33 in housing, um, which by the way, I guess we're in. I um, thought it was rather interesting because what the lady over here said, it is very difficult to find housing in this market. Uh, and I guess that, that it probably is because it's a, you know, a place that people do want to live. Okay? But my question is related to quality of life in communities like this because I think there's a lot of upside on opportunity for quality of life in our community. Um, but what causes quality of life to swing one way or the other? What causes the pendulum to swing one way or the other? And in a case like where we sit in this community, is the pendulum swinging one way or to the other necessarily? That's what I'm just kind of curious about. Where, where do you see that going? To an economist, um, two things change quality of life. One is people migrate and move and in seeking quality of life. And so where people are moving are higher quality of life places. And most U.S. counties are shrinking. So if you're in a county, particularly a rural county that's growing, that's evidence that people are moving with their feet to this place because of perceived quality of life. The other factor is incomes change our preferences. So when I was a boy in the, in the mid-1960s, one in three of all people worked in manufacturing and half of all other jobs depended on those jobs. You didn't choose where you live. If you wanted to work in a factory, if you wanted to work, you probably would choose to live where that factory was. And today, it's about 8% of people work in factories. Some share of them remotely. And so every job that we teach in the College of Business at Ball State, and darn near every job at the university, every occupation that we're training for, there's a job in every American county, almost every American county. I mean, there's counties of 300 people, but you know, any place of 10,000 people, there's a job there. That was not the case 70 years ago. And so as we become richer, as our economy shifted towards more service-based because we're richer, that the options, we prefer more non-market things, things that we don't directly buy. So, experiences, third places, things that we don't have a market price for like government services. So if you're looking for quality of life changes, it's those big things of people moving and our preferences changing. I think there's going to be some leadership change on preference changes. You can show people. Every place that I've been that has built a trail, and I've been studying trails for almost 20 years now. I had an early paper on the economic effect of trails when I was an assistant professor at Brown Air. 
Um, every place that I've been, the mayors have told me the same thing. I really fought to get this trail built. Everybody thought it was a boondoggle. Within six months, everybody then, I got apology after apology over the number of people telling me I was wrong. I had no idea how many people would use it. And so uh, there, there is some leadership component to that. So it, you can discreetly change, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to give a formula of what things you've got to have for your county or for your city, because the, the best way to approach this, and I'm sure Dave will speak on it, is don't think so much about attracting people to your community. Think about making your community an attractive place for the people in here, and that will attract people. If people aren't just gonna randomly choose Jasper, they're gonna come here because they've seen it on TV, they've heard about it because of an LPGA tour, or they know somebody's here. And really focus on that sort of, you know, satisfying the preferences of the people here. And, it, and, and the amenity list we have is suggestive of things you need to think about, but you also have to look and see what you already have. If you already have the best schools in southern Indiana, do they need to be better or do you need to tell people that? I, I don't know. That's I don't have an easy formula. I, I there's not an easy formula. And I, I think uh, if I were to look at Jasper, I, I would and actually all of you books, I know what's happening in Huntingburg and I and, and know what's happening in Ferdinand. I think the county, with the, 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 these three major communities, is really in a good spot, in a, in a really good spot. We need to understand, um, and I've been in this business a long time, um, there's a cyclical nature for communities. Uh, and right now, I'd say Du Bois County is at the convergence of a lot of good stuff. <clears throat> and, and I think uh, there are two things I would think about. Uh, one is that value proposition and continue to provide that value uh, to all of our residents to make this the best place for our residents now. But in order to keep understanding that value proposition, that requires that openness and that engagement and an understanding between the elected officials and our residents on how we can make ourselves better. And, and if that does get into that soft stuff, soft stuff that Mike doesn't want to talk about, but that's incredibly, incredibly important for uh, continuing that upward uh, trajectory that I see happening in Lewis County. And let me just add one thing. I agree with David. I think you're clearly in the positive slope of quality of life here. And, but you don't have to take my word for it. You just look at the uh, housing markets and look at the census population estimates over the past few years. Um, uh, and that's come with a lot of work. I also drive around the state. Really love what our communities are doing. And uh, you're way up there. You're way up there. Any other? I'm sorry? We're way up there, but still room to grow. Oh, still room, yes. Still room to thrive and cross. I, I really want to, again, thank them for coming down and answering some of these questions. Great questions. It's not the end of the questions. You know, we'll have more questions as we go home. Uh, they have told me that the presentation tonight, uh, it's really public information, it's the research. Published, so if there is a need for a copy of the presentation, let me know. In my office, no, we'll try to get you. If you don't have them printed out, I might send it to you electronically. You know, uh, it would be available information. So, with that, again, I'd like to thank both Dr. Hicks and David for being here. I think uh, spending time driving around and just having a discussion about where we are is. Community as a county has has been a great thing. And I've learned a lot tonight with them, and I hope it at least opens up the perspectives of the rest of us out here. Thank you, Josh.
We have some parting gifts here for both Dave and Dr. Hicks. Some things from Dubois County. So thank you very much. One more round of applause.